All right, let's do this. Uh, so this time for reals, this time for reals, exam next Friday. This time for reals, okay? I was off with my dates and stuff. What's that? No, no, it's next time. It's next time, next Friday, okay? And then, like I said, probably next Monday, Monday or Friday, possibly, I'll post example problems from previous years, right? And then you can work through those. And then on Wednesday or Thursday, we'll do kind of a review session. Usually I do it on Wednesday, because then that's two days before the exam, as opposed to Thursday, the night before the exam. And so like, if you're any shortcoming, so we'll probably do the same thing. Uh, I, I mean, I haven't worked it out yet, but it'll probably be six-ish at night in this room. It's kind of what it, what it is. And then again, we'll just go over those two problems that I assigned. That what's gonna be on it is kinematics, okay? Geometry of motion in some capacity, a problem associated with everything we've done up until kinetics. And then there'll be one F equals MA problem, the stuff we've been working on last couple of days. So, so basically the, all the first three homeworks or four homeworks, and then uh, the one that's due on, on this Friday, what, what we're doing for the, that's due this Friday will be on that, that exam. And then we'll have light homework next week so you can prepare for the exam. It's just two problems is all it is, right? And then, uh, then we go from there. Cool. Any questions about that? Right, you get one page of notes, right? So you can feel comfortable with that. Like I said, we'll go through more details when we get closer, but just to put, have that on your radar, right? And then basically from then on out, it's like every two to three weeks, we'll have another one. This first one takes a while to get far enough where we have it, but then from, from here on out, it'll be just like every two to three weeks, we'll have, we'll have midterms or quizzes, however you want to think about it. Okay, uh, so we just did this problem. All right, this was the people jumping off the bridge and we calculated uh, you know, what, what kind of tension was gonna be in that rope and we discovered that they were gonna be in trouble. Okay? Which then leads us on to this next coordinate system, which is polar coordinates. And a lot of times these things overlap and sometimes you can choose which one you want to use. You could do normal tangent or polar coordinates. Right? It just kind of depends on if your radius is getting bigger or smaller. If it's not, then, then they overlap. If it's just if things are traveling in a circle, then they overlap. Okay, so again, in this coordinate system, just a reviewer, a refresher, right? You have some fixed origin off to the side, and then you have a position vector that's defined by uh, its magnitude and its angle, by an, by an R magnitude and an angle. And then the uh, vector, the, the base vector, will point off in the same direction that R is pointed, and then there'll be one tangent to that called E theta, and it's, uh, it's perpendicular, it's 90 degrees from that ER, okay? When we went through that derivation, this is what we got for velocity, right? The velocity vector was R dot, how is R changing in the ER direction, plus R omega in the E theta direction. So how much does the change in direction cause, or a change in angle cause uh, velocity. So, but what we're really after is what our accelerations were in this coordinate system. Our accelerations in this coordinate system were r double dot minus r omega squared in the er direction. So centripetal acceleration and radial acceleration, right? Uh, and we talked in detail about what each of these represent. And then you have those are in the er direction. That would be acceleration this way. If we're looking in e theta direction, we have r alpha, r times alpha. How is omega changing? And that's going to cause a change in uh, acceleration or change in velocity rather and then 2r dot omega the omega is this the Coriolis right and so then and basically to do these problems you just do the same as we did last time we're just gonna sum the forces in the different directions it's just now when we write down accelerations you know we'll sum the forces in the r direction that's mass times acceleration in the r and then you know acceleration in the r is just gonna be r double dot minus r omega squared a lot of times these terms a lot of these terms go to zero Right in the theta direction, sum the forces in the theta. So this is same procedure we did before. It's just now when you get down to the equations of motion, we're writing these guys instead. Right, sum the forces in the theta, mass times r alpha plus r dot omega. Now, uh, in z direction, we're going to do the, the you know the z direction. Uh, we're just going to add an, an additional make these things three D, make it cylindrical coordinates basically by just adding in uh, a z direction. Okay, uh, so let's do a problem. Okay, example problem here. This is a two kilogram collar on this rod. Okay, 
This thing is spinning around with a, what is a minimum, so we're gonna try to find the constant omega, right? That tells us right there, a little ding, ding, ding. If it's a constant omega, omega, then alpha is equal to zero, it's not accelerating. And you can imagine if this thing spins faster, that collar is gonna go and start sliding up the rod. If it goes too slow, it's gonna start sliding down the rod. And we're gonna to try to find the omega just so it holds it in that position right there and it doesn't slide up, okay? And this one has friction in it, so there is friction involved in this thing, okay? And you're like, oh my God, what do I do, right? It's okay, right? Just stick to the plan. Right? We've, 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 we've talked about this, right? We're just gonna do what, we're, what we usually do. We're gonna start out, we're gonna draw a free body diagram, we're gonna do equations of motion, and then we're gonna do kinematics as required, and then we're gonna solve it, okay? That being said, there's a little bit of bookkeeping up front, okay? To try to think about how, our, to come up with our coordinate system here, okay? So this thing's spinning around in a circle, right? This, way, what would look like a circle would be as if I looked at it from above, right? So, so you gotta, I always do, draw, do a little drawing where I kind of look at it from above. If you look at it from above, this collar's gonna be traveling around in a circle. So let's, let's do that, just to kind of get our, our bearing state straight, our coordinate straight, if you will. All right, so this thing is gonna be traveling in a circle. See if I can draw a circle with the help of an iPad. Nailed it. You guys ever seen, seen competitions on YouTube where people drive it, draw in perfect circles? There's a full competition on it, right? Just, right? And then they come back and they measure to see how perfect and imperfect it is, and it's a full competition. I tell you, I spent I spent some time on YouTube, right, in the past. I'm trying to get I'm trying to break the habit. Okay. So if we're looking at it from above. Okay, we have a, that, this is the collar right here, right? And the collar, it's coordinate system, right? There's gonna be a coordinate system pointed out at it. I like to do this, this step, just to get my bearing straight, right? My, my R position, right? It's gonna be traveling around a circle, right? If I look down and above, so that's my, my R is coming out there, right? My coordinates, Oh, what color to make this? Oh, that's too... I'm running out of colors here. Let's do blue. Right? So my ER is going to be going that way. And my E theta is going to go this way. Right? Look down on it. It's going to be... It's, you know, it's really traveling in a plane like that. So it's traveling around in a circle. I got ER just keeps going in that direction. E theta is in the, it's, uh, in the direction of increasing theta, just like that, okay? One thing I'm gonna do here too is I'm gonna label what this radius is gonna be, right? They, in the problem statement over here, they tell us that this, this angle, the hypotenuse part of this thing is 0 0.25 meters, but I need to figure out what the radius is. When I look down on it, that's not gonna be the radius that it's traveling around. If I'm looking down the projected uh, radius is going to be different, right? The projected radius right? This radius is going to be equal to 0 0.25 I mean if you want again When I get when I, when we give the three four five triangles, we're doing that. I'm doing it to help you a little bit, okay, but if you if you were to label that theta 0 0.25 times cosine theta is what it would be. And then cosine theta, right, just to, just to give you, a, you know, like I said, start trying to think of these things in terms of triangles. Right? You're used to, this is a little, take a little side step so you see what we're doing here if you don't get this part of it, right? So, so everybody would buy that, right? If I do 0 0.25 times cosine theta, it'll give me what the radius is that I want. Cosine theta is just adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent over hypotenuse is just four over five, right? Cosine theta is just four over five, right? So when I do this, it's 0 0.225 times four over five equals 0 0.2. Is these in meters, is that what this thing is? Meters. Right. This little, you don't have to do the cosine theta thing. You, you can jump right to the four over five. I just, it, it's uh, probably about a quarter of you 
when you get a three, four, five triangle, about a quarter of you figure out what the angle is and then use that angle and then put it back into cosine. You come back and you figure out the angle and do cosine theta with it afterwards. That's fine. If you have to do it that way, do that way. But, but this is better, right? Because cosine theta is just four over five. So you might as well just jump to four over five and you skip the finding the angle and then taking cosine of theta. Like if you went and found the angle and then took cosine of it, your answer would be four over five, right? So, so just, just do that. I mean, I, again, I know on an exam when you freak it out and you got, you're, you're hustling through it and stuff like that, just do what, do what works for you. I will, I will pass judgment a little bit when I grade it, just a little bit, right? But I won't shame you. <laughs> no, I won't shame you. <laughs> it just, it is. It's a hint. It's a little trick. You should be glad when you get a three, four, five triangle, right? Okay. And then again, omega, just to label it up here, omegas go like this. So that, that step really wasn't part of this. Uh, you know, I would almost call this, I actually, I would call this, I would call this a kinematic step. Right? Kinematics is just geometry of motion. This is geometry, right? We're looking at it from above. We're looking at the projections. We're looking at what the radius is. I would, I would label that kinematics, okay? And then figuring out what our coordinate system is. Okay, so then we got, we got all our bearings straight. We know what's happening. We know where our circle's at. We know where our polar coordinates is. We're ready to go. Okay, now... Let's now do our free body diagram. Okay. And I'm going to draw the free body diagram as it looks here. Okay. If I'm looking at it like that. So I'm going to isolate my mass. Done. Okay. What forces are acting on that collar? Gravity. Gravity going like this. Mass times gravity. What else? Normal force. Normal force. What else? We got one more. Friction. Okay. We got a little decision making to do here. Which way is the friction going to be going? Yeah, right. It, it's, it's tied to this, the minimum constant angular velocity so that the collar does not slip down the rod, right? So we're trying to find it so that it doesn't slip down the rod. So if it's not going to slip down the rod, so that we're trying to find the friction up and right. If we're trying to find the minimum, the maximum so that it doesn't slide up the rod, we'd have it going down. Right? So it would be, if we're trying to find minimum going up, we go up to the left. If we're trying to find the maximum so it doesn't slide up, we'd have it coming down, right? Go like that. Okay, so we get to, we'll put it in there like that. Right? If, they, if they flipped it and said the other way, then you'd, you'd, just, you'd switch the direction of your, of your friction. My angles are off here a little bit. That's okay. That should be everything, right? We got the normal force, we have a friction force, we have mass times gravity, the direction of the friction force is dependent based off the problem statement right there. Right? It's gonna it's gonna help us in this. Okay. Uh, so now that's not everything, right? Now we gotta label our coordinate system. Right? Our coordinate system, our ER is gonna be going this way. Right? And remember we're we're this drawing up here on the right, that's what it is looking down from above. So if I'm looking at it now as like a cross section coming in this way, if I'm looking at it coming in this way, that's what I'm doing. I'm looking at it coming in that way. My ER is going to be to the right. right? And what's going to be going up and down on this? Z. Yeah, Z direction. Right? So then my this right here would be my, what was I calling it? E. In the K direction, sorry, just calling it K direction. Going that way. Where's E theta? Yep, into the page. E theta is going into the page. Okay? Note that there's no forces acting into the page either, right? So that'll, that'll come into play a little bit later. But there's ERs coming out there, K is going up that way. E theta is going into the board. Right? There's our free body diagram. Not quite done. We're going to label some. 
label some angles in here, right? Because I need to figure out what component of F is this way, what component of F is this way, right? What component is this way, of N is this way, what component is this way? At least starting out, I like to put the actual components in there. I like to put them in there so when I go to sum them, I, I know what to use there. And then label some of these terms here, or some of the angles rather. Again, this is a four, three, five. And then this one would then be a three, four, five. A little geometry. Cool, cool, cool. I think it's worth spending a little extra time making a nice, neat, clean three by diagram with a straight edge if you got one. Okay, any questions about that? I missed anything? I think we're good. Okay. Um, April, I'll do one other thing. I'll just make sure that we know that this is going to be mu static times the normal force. And they give us mu stat. Did they give us mu static? Yep, I added it later. 0 0.2 is very mu static. So that friction force is going to be dependent on the normal force. So you kind of see like, these things are going to be linked together. The friction force is going to be dependent upon what's it, what the normal force is. So there's a little bit of independent or dependence there rather. Okay. So next step is free body diet or uh, equations of motion. E uh, M's. Take our time with this. Just gonna go through all the different directions. Some of the forces in the theta direction is equal to mass times a theta. My forces in that direction are zero is equal to m times r alpha plus two r dot omega. I mean, I just, I mean, there's zero forces acting that direction, right? So we should know that the accelerations here are all going to be zero, but we'll just kind of go through it. Our alpha, right? We're doing a constant omega. So our alpha is going to be zero. Our dot is also going to be zero, right? So that's a good sign that zero equals zero. Right? There's nothing going on in that direction. If this thing was speeding up, right, if it was speeding up, if it had an alpha, then there would be a component in that direction. There'd be a force going that direction, and we could solve for what that was, right? And where it would show up, if this thing was accelerating, right, if, it, if we had an alpha, not just a constant omega, if, it, if that omega was getting faster and faster, this normal force wouldn't just be in the K and the ER direction. That normal force would have a component in the theta direction, right? You kind of want to stay put, but it's getting accelerated, so that normal force would have kind of some of the E theta and some uh, in the K and some in the R, right? So, but in this case, that alpha zero, there are no forces acting that direction, uh, and so it equals zero. And, and in fact, actually, the, pro the way you probably should do this, I, I probably, I shouldn't have just assumed that was in the K and the ER direction. I probably should have assumed that it was in the other direction. And then when I came down and I looked at my accelerations, I would have seen that that was zero. I would see that the R is not changing, then that would also be zero. And then because of that, that normal force in that direction would be zero. That's probably how I should have done it. But I'm a doctor. I knew that going into it. So I, I, didn't, I didn't need to do that. Okay. So that's the theta direction. So now we just keep going. Now we go, let's go the R direction. Some of the forces in the R direction. Mass times AR. Acceleration in the R direction. Right? So then we just come back up to our free body diagram, which is nice and complete and beautiful. And we say, what's happening in the R direction? Well, I've got this component of the friction force. I've got this component of the normal force. Right? That should be it. Right? So then let's do that. Some of the forces, we're going to go my friction force times four fifths, right? Yep. Friction force times four fifths. That's positive, right? It's acting in the positive ER direction, so that's a positive. And then that normal force is acting opposite, so that's nine, uh, N times three fifths, right? 
The reason it's negative is because it's acting that way, whereas the friction force is acting that way. It's acting negative. That's equal to, now we just write down what the uh, acceleration looks like in that direction. And that's going to be mass times r double dot minus r omega squared. Okay. r double dot is zero. It's a constant radius. Right? So r double dot is going to be equal to zero. So it's just equal to r omega squared. Okay, everything's good there. And then we're going to look at the last direction. Some of the forces in the z direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the z direction. Right? And so we say, what's happening in the z direction? Well, I've got this component of the, no component of the normal force, this component of the friction force, and, and gravity. So I got those three. Right? N and F should be positive, and mass times gravity should be negative. Let me just keep going with that. Friction force times three fifths plus the normal force times four fifths minus mass times gravity is equal to what's the acceleration in the z direction? Zero, right? It's gonna be zero. It's not gonna accelerate. It's not accelerating up. It's not accelerating down, right? <coughs> If we gave you that problem statement said that it was accelerating up or accelerating down, we would know what that is. But it's saying this thing's staying put, right? We're trying to find the case where it's staying put. That's the key to this one. So this whole thing is equal to zero. Okay. Our answer is in there. Okay. So I like to look at this point, right? We got two equations. And at this point, see how many unknowns we have. All right, we got friction, normal, and omega. Right, we're after the omega. Just to again, always remind yourself what you're, I'm after that omega right there. Right, I got three. I got three variables, but two equations. What am I missing here? Yeah. Um, can we substitute the friction then for yep. That's right. Yep, that's right. So I could just take this. I mean, technically, there is. I think you were going to say the same thing, or someone over here. That that that. Right? Technically, friction is related. I mean, that's, I guess, another way to look at it. That's another equation. That'd be a third equation, right? But really, we could substitute in what the friction force is. It's going to be mu static times n, right? So really, there's just two unknowns. The normal force right? the normal force and omega, right? Once you get to this st stage right here, guess what, I, guess what I did? I plugged it in my calculator, right? Your TI-89 will do systems of equations. You could do the solve function. This is the solve equation in your TI-89. You just set up one equation, a comma, another equation in curly braces, and then you say comma, and then you say in curly braces, I wanna solve for uh, uh, the normal force and omega, and then it goes beep, takes about two milliseconds and then bam, pops the, out the answer and it's gonna be the right answer. And then you could look at the, the printout on your calculator and see that you entered the, the equations right. And then it'd be like, oh man, it actually matches, right? And then you got it, okay? And then, or, or you could do it the lame way where you do like substitution or something like that. Do what you need to do, right? If you, right? But, but calculators, and, and does T83 and 84 do systems of equations? Yeah, then learn how to do that on your TI-83 and 84, right? Right, and so what I, what I get, what you get, I mean, actually, this, actually, this one's pretty easy. This, this one, you could solve directly for the normal force just with that equation, and then you take the answer there, and then you put it up there for the normal force. Anyways, but I just I put it in my calculator anyway. I'm still going to stand by the way I did it, right? So then what you get is omega is equal to plus or minus 4.85 rads per second. And then we get the normal force equal to 21.32 newtons. Okay.
The problem statement didn't ask us for what the normal force is, but we had to get the normal force to get the answer. Right? And so and then it makes sense that it's 4.85, or that's plus or minus rather, because it could go either way, right? You can imagine this thing spin in one direction, that would be happening. You could imagine it spinning in the other direction, the same thing would happen, right? You'd find the minimum. And again, if you were after the maximum so that it doesn't slide up, you would back here when we assumed which way the friction force was going, you'd have that friction force going down and to the left. And now you'd be able to find so that it doesn't, so it doesn't slide up. You're right on the cusp of sliding up. This is right on the cusp of sliding down. This is as slow as you can go so it doesn't slide down. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Let's do the next one. It's very similar to this one. Oh, yeah. And then all right, let's finish this. This is probably your kinematics. That's probably my kinematics up there. We did them out of order. And then here's your solving right here. Just to show you that we did do all of those steps. And our solving was down there. Where we solved that system. Okay. This one's very, the next one's really similar. Okay. The pendulum connected to the vertical shaft with a rope, right? And so this basically, it, it attaches, spinning around in a circle, okay? Whipping this ball around in a circle. And you can imagine if I spin it really fast, it's gonna be perfectly horizontal. If I, if I don't spin it at all, it's gonna be flat. And then, but if I'm somewhere in between, I can kind of control that height of it, right? Speeding up or slowing down to control how high that ball is gonna be. In this case, they're, they're trying to find the constant omega and the, or, or in this case, it's speed of B, which would be related to omega and the tension in the rope when that thing is held at 85 degrees, okay? Uh, so same, same idea. Let's look at this thing from above, kind of do our kinematics first just so I can get where my bearings and where my coordinate system is going to be, right? If I, again, if I look at it from above, it will look like a circle. It's going to give me, oh, did it. It's going to look like a circle. I'm going to have ER going out this way. Oh. ER hat going like this. E theta going like this. Right? This radius, that R would be equal to 0 0.4 times sine of 85, 0 0.398. Mm. Right, so just messing around with this, this triangle here. It's giving you the, the length of the rope. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and, but, but it's pretty dang close with 85 degrees close to 90 and so then it ends up being 0.398 but we're going to be very specific we're going to be because again remember in this class there's exact answers to things right it's not like when you go into the real world and there's no exact answer to stuff we're, we're still in the realm of exact answers okay the other thing i want to take it just this quick moment here is talk about is could you do this with normal tangent in a z direction absolutely right if it's traveling in a circle then, then the normal tangent polar coordinates overlap, right? The only, if you did do it that way, your ET would be this way and your, your EN would be this way, right? And, and it works. It's just when you get to mass times acceleration, your centripetal acceleration in the ER direction, there's a negative on that one because centripetal acceleration is acting this way, but then ER is going that way. So your centripetal acceleration is negative R omega squared. If you do it in polar coordinate coordinates, your centripetal acceleration is in the positive uh, uh, direction. So, but again, just things that people have messed up with in the past. Right? They, they do overlap. It's just the direction that that's pointed is a little screw. Okay, so we're going to do a free body diagram. F, B, D, F, B, D, I'm going to isolate my mass. Done. I'm going to put in my forces. We got mass times gravity going down. 
I got my tension force going like this. That's it, right? This thing's flying around, right? Again, if there was an alpha, we would pick up a component in one of the directions. There is no normal force in this situation, right? Because there's just a tension force applied to it like that, right? But again, not done with my coordinates or my, my free body diagram because I want to put in my coordinate system, right? In any dimensions that I have. My coordinate system, ER is going out this way. K again is going this way. It's like the last one. And E theta would be into the board. Right. Kind of break this thing into its components. Right? T is going to have a component like that and a component like this. Right? And this angle right here is 85. That should be everything, right? right. Like I said, this one's really similar to the last one. Two equations of motion. Again, T would have a component in the E theta direction if there was acceleration. So I think the right way to do that would be You'd say, yep, some of the forces in the theta direction is equal to mass times A theta. Right. You could say this T, I'll call it T theta. Just Again, this is probably how you should do it. We don't know if there's a direction that way, but there, there could be. Is equal to mass times R alpha plus 2r dot omega. Is it a plus? Is it a plus or is it minus? Plus. Get this the right color. All right. Alpha, zero, because it's constant omega. R is zero, R dot rather is zero because it's constant R, right? It's traveling around in a perfect circle, so there is no R getting bigger or smaller, right? So both of those are equal to zero, which means T is equal to zero, which means everything's equal to zero. There's nothing happening in the theta direction, okay? Some of the forces in the R direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the R direction. Look what's happening in the R direction. I've got this guy, that's it. A component of the tension force in the negative ER direction. Minus T times sine of 85 is equal to mass times R double dot minus R omega squared. R double dot is zero. Then some of the forces in the theta direction. We don't, we can't solve it. Yeah. Yep, we can't solve it yet, right? Because I don't know the tension force and I don't know what omega is. I don't know what either one of those are, so I gotta keep going. I gotta write down another equation of motion, add something, some other stuff that we know, not theta direction, I wasn't done yet. This is z direction. Some of the forces in the z direction is equal to mz double dot. What do we have acting in the, that direction? I look at my free body diagram. I see that we've got a component of T and MG. Those two forces right there. Then let's do that. This is positive T cosine of 85 minus MG, right? MG is negative because it's acting in the opposite direction of Z. And that again is equal to zero. Right? It's equal to zero because it's holding steady at 85. Right? We want to find it so that it's just sticking there. Which means it's not going to be accelerating up, it's not going to be accelerating down. Okay. And that's that. Basically solve these two guys. 
right, that was my step four. Or three, three, four, four. Solve. Oh, solve. Do so with the my calculator. I get T is equal to 134.9 newtons. I get omega equal to plus or minus 16.77 radians per, se radian radians per second. And then really it asks for the speed, which would be the velocity, which would be r times omega, which would be equal to plus or minus 6.67 meters per second. Right, if you get to that step and you give me omega and you don't give me the speed, I'm not going to dock you for that, right? Because it's omega is the angular speed of it, and then velocity is actually the speed in, in uh, not the angular speed, but just the actual speed. So, but that's how you convert between those two. Okay, and they're very straightforward, right? Remember, I said this is better. This is better to do the integrals and stuff, right? Integrals are pain in the ass, and then the first part of the class, you're like, oh, what do I do? And you have a chain rule, and sometimes you do use it, sometimes you don't, and then sometimes you work your way through, and right, it's very answer. These problems are so straightforward. They're beautiful, right? You just follow these steps, and then and then it just leads you to the right answer. Even if it even if you get it slightly wrong at the end. You're going to get most of the points, right? Because it's usually just going to be a small like calculation error or be a small little thing. But for the most part, you're going to get most of the points in there, unless you leave something really important off, like tension force or something like that, right? If you really blow it, but but usually if you just follow these steps, it leads you to the right answer, and you're here most of your most of the credit. Any questions about this? Okay, you guys doing okay? Monday morning, eight o'clock. All right. All right, let's talk about things going to orbit. Okay, this is kind of cool. If you think the Earth is not round, after this you should you should be you should be convinced. Okay, this is pretty cool. This one this is actually one of my favorite topics to talk about in this class because it honestly I didn't know what it meant for something to go into orbit until I was about your age. That's a true statement. Right, I was just like, oh, you just shoot it up there. You just shoot it up there, and then it just it's in orbit, right? Like, like that's, that's, what, that's what happened. I guess I never put any thought to it. So I actually might teach you something today, okay? So, so how does something go into orbit? I, and this is how it was taught to me. This is how I'll, I'll pass it off to you. And maybe you guys learned this when you are in middle school, but I didn't, right? Helen, Helen Montana in the 80s left this part out, okay? And, and maybe, that's where all the, maybe that's where all of the, maybe that's where all of the flat earthers came from, where it started in Helen Montana, where they left this stuff out, okay? So... Right? This is what I said. Right? When you throw, we just learned about projectile motion, right? When you throw something, right, it takes a parabolic, parabolic curve. If I throw it up, it does a parabola. If I throw it straight across, the same thing will happen, is, right? It'll have the velocity this way, but then it has an acceleration down component, right? The gravity component down. And so the way it was taught, it was like, oh, I say I'm a person sitting right here, right? And I throw a ball, right? I'm going to throw, throw a ball. And if I just throw it a little ways, right, it goes like this, boop. But if I throw it harder, it goes boop. If I throw a little bit harder, it goes boop. But if I throw it really fucking hard, right? In fact, I, I think I could do this. Let me see here. I thought there was a way I could draw dashed lines in here. It doesn't matter, but I, oh yeah, I can. Oh, yeah. Look at this shit. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, baby. It only took about 10 minutes to do it, but I did it. Anyways, okay. I drew a dash slider. I mean, if you guys learned that before, that's how something goes into orbit, right? Obviously, that doesn't work that I mean, I just blew my mind. I was like, holy shit, would you look at that, right? Like, I get, I buy it, I buy it, I buy it. Holy shit, it just, it just, the earth falls out faster than the thing falls back down to ground, and that shit's in orbit, right? Obviously, throwing it on the ground, it'd be really difficult to do because there's mountains and air and people and cars and stuff like that, right? So if I throw, so, but you go, 
out into space where you don't have the atmosphere, people and cars and things to get in the way. And then that's, that works, right? That's what's beautiful about it. I love talking about space because, it, you know, we talked about how there's exact answers to stuff down here. There's exact answers to shoot up in space, okay? Because there's nothing else up there. It's just it's space, right? There is. There are things up there. There are things. There's, you know, it's, the, it, satellites have to adjust on occasion because there is drag that's associated with other stuff that I don't get, and there's things that are hitting it and stuff. But there is some adjustment. But for the most part, space is pure. There's just space, and things just work. We calculate stuff, right? And then, and then if not today, by, by, by Wednesday, I'll, I'll be able to tell you how fast, mathematically, we're going to calculate it, that the International Space Station is traveling, right? And then, and then we'll look it up on the internet, and it'll say the exact same fucking thing, right? Which, is, which is, just blows my mind, right? It's that, that this happens, OK? Okay, all right, so that's, that's how something goes into orbit, right? So can we solve that problem with our mechanics that we've done so far? Absolutely, because it's pure. There's not much going on out there, okay? So then we have uh, this system right here, right? We have Earth. We have Earth as we, as we see it, okay? Okay, and uh, we have a satellite that's traveling. This is circular orbits, right? So we have a satellite that's traveling around the outside of that thing. We've got some different dimensions. H is, is it, the height above the center of the Earth, or I'm sorry, uh, the surface of the Earth uh, that their satellite is going to be traveling. And you've got the radius of the Earth in there. That's going to play a, a part of it, right? That's part of the, that's part of the height that we calculate because gravity is acting towards the center of the Earth, okay? Uh, and then where's our coordinate system on this, okay? Our coordinate system... Right? It's traveling around in a circle, right? We could think of a, a, some vector pointed out to, oh, look at this, dot, dotted still. All right, it's pointed out to there, okay? And then it has coordinates. Oh, this, I've got a coordinate, oh, that's dark. Uh, I've got this guy, ER hat, and then I'd have an E theta going this way. There's our coordinate system, right? Let me come over here. I will say that when we calculate the when we calculate the 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 International Space Station, what's happening up there? This figure right here is definitely not the scale, right? Just to put this, actually, I'll write them down here. It, it is. This blows my mind too, right? The radius of the Earth is equal to six thousand. 378 kilometers and the height of the International Space Station is equal to 340 kilometers. Right, just a little side note. So this graph, this picture right here is not to scale when we're talking uh, uh, International Space Station, right? The International Space Station, it would just be like the lines would overlap on our graph, right? Because the International Space it's really close to Earth. Okay, it's really close to Earth relative to the uh, di or the radius of the Earth. Okay, so got our coordinate system lined up. Right, let's do a free body diagram. Come on, free body diagram. Right, there's not much going on there. Right, I got my isolated body. What forces do I have on, acting on it in space? Gravity. That's it, right? That's it. That's all we got out there. It's beautiful. Like gravity, right? But it, when you're talking orbits, we cannot just say it's mass times gravity. We're going to call it a uh, force of gravity, Fg, right? Because, again, it's going to change, right? Gravity really does change. The further the two objects are apart, uh, it, so it's a function of position. The further two objects are apart, then there's less gravitational pull. Okay. What our coordinates look like here. Right. We have ER acting like this, or ER direction this way, and then we have E theta this way. That's it. And then we come over here, 
right? Or equations of motion. Two equations of motion. Right? The only thing going on, there's only something really happening in the R direction. So let's just write down those. Some of the force in the R direction is equal to negative FG. That's it. And that's equal to the mass of the satellite times r double dot minus r omega squared. So we just stick to the plan that we had, right? This is a weird situation, but we're just going to stick to the plan that we laid out before, right? r double dot is zero, right? Because it's not changing that angle right there. Right? If we're, we're going to calculate velocities, not mm, we're going to calculate that's a new, we're going to calculate vo velocities, not omegas. So let's jump right to that. So this is negative m sat times v squared over r. And what we're after is that velocity. I just kind of rearranged this, right? I just substituted in. R times omega is equal to velocity right there. Okay? So I know what FG is, or I, I, I can get that, right? This is like Newton's law of gravitational attraction, I think. So that equation is G times the mass of the Earth times mass of the satellite divided by the distance between them, Earth plus H squared. Right? That's Newton's, Newton's gravity equation, right? It's a proportion between the two masses and then the distance in between them, plus this gravitational constant out front, this G, that, this big G that's out front, okay? So, let's substitute this in for FG. Let's solve this sucker out. Uh, we do know, okay. Yep, 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 okay. So, negative... G times M Earth times M Sat divided by the distance between them, R Earth plus H squared is equal to negative M Sat times V squared over R Earth plus H. Okay, so that's this, this, I just rearranged, I just sub took this, right, substituting for FG, and then set that to the equal to this. That's all that next step is, okay? We're almost there, just give me one second. We cross out a lot of stuff, right? The mass of the satellite crosses out from both sides, right? Our Earth, one of these goes away, right? And if you solve for this, you could solve for that velocity, right? And what you get for velocity, velocity is equal to G M Earth all over the radius of the Earth plus H. And that's to the one half, the square root of that. You could solve for what that velocity is, right? G M Earth is a known constant. G M Earth is equal to 398,600.5 kilograms cubed per meter squared. If you substitute that in and the height of the International Space Station, VISS is equal to 7.7 kilometers per second and it's like is that fast that seems fast right so the international space station is traveling at 7.7 .7 kilometers per second that's fast right but i like giving miles per hour okay 
like a miles per hour right that's what i'm that's what i'm a fan of right if you put this in uh, miles per hour that's 17,224 miles per hour it's very fast right 17,224 miles per hour the international space station is traveling relative to the surface of the earth 70,000 224 miles, or relative to the center of the Earth, rather, 70,224 miles per hour. We'll, we'll look at this, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this on, on Wednesday, but they're booking, right? So when you see it, when you see well, uh, it, the, uh, uh, a launch, right, not only are, just, are they getting up to 340 kilometers, they 340 kilometers above Earth, they get up to 340 kilometers, and then they're accelerating to 17,224 kilometers per, or miles per hour. Right, they're booking. So a lot of that, right, when you when you look at the the launching, it launches like this, right? Sh shoots up and it goes and they gotta get going that direction, seventeen thousand km or miles per hour. Right? So they're booking. Right? And we'll we'll talk about this later. There's some other cool things. There's a thing called geosynchronous orbit, where that comes from and stuff like that. There's some cool stuff. So cool be. All right, break. Yeah, there we go. Hey, Yon. Good, how you doing?